Hi there, my name is Tim Hutchings and this is the very first of what will be a series of monthly podcasts for AW, or Athletics Weekly magazine as was, and it's fitting that the first person we're talking with is AW publisher, Olympic silver medalist, sometime GB team manager and all-round good egg, Wendy Sly, MBE. I hope I've not left out anything too important, but Wendy, tell me, how did you first get into the sport, which has now become in many ways your life? Well, I came from a very outdoorsy family and um, I played loads of sports at school. So netball, hockey, rounders, a bit of football. And of course, ran in the school sports day and um, always did quite well. So it was a school teacher. Um, as many kids of my generation, um, I was influenced massively by my PE teacher and she was the one who suggested I joined an athletics club. So I went and begged my mum and dad if I could join the local athletics club. I was put on a waiting list and um, joined Feltham AC as it then was in um, February of 1971. Um, so just after the age of 11 um, and that was really the start of my running life. And who were your guiding forces, your coach or coaches, and who had the biggest influence on you? When I first joined the Athletics Club, I joined a group run by a guy called Mr Brothers, and he looked after all the young people there. Um, we did a massive variety of different things. We ran around the field, we um, ran up the stadium steps, we did long jump, high jump hurdles, ran on the track, um, and it was really good fun. Um, met lots of young people there and um, yeah, we generally just enjoyed ourselves. I was pretty successful in those first year, few years, but didn't necessarily really see it as that. It was my hobby, um, I guess my youth club. I think the key thing when you're 11, 12, 13, 14 is that you keep interested. And Mr Brothers made all of our training sessions fun. As I say, there was a lot of chat and um, laughter and we used to go to league races in his his van and, and listen to the top 20 on the radio. So it was all just good times and I think that kept me interested in athletics and not doing other sports or doing other things. So he was very key. And then um, Neville Taylor, who was my coach right through... Um, from being a pretty good junior to being an Olympian and winning a medal. Um, he really shaped my training into being far more professional um, and was the leader of a very good group of um, male athletes, which obviously helped me a lot as well. So, yeah, he was fantastic. And then um, towards the end of my career, Peter Coe, um, Seb's father and coach, who was um, just really good, I think, at taking my training to a different level with lots of conditioning work, which um, many of the athletes do now, but perhaps wasn't so common in the late 80s. And, I mean, those are people who were influential in your life that you were directly in contact with, but did you have heroes that you had posters of in your bedroom wall as a kid or people that you looked up to and had read about, um, you know, who, who inspired you like that? Well, I watched Lillian Board um, and was a very big fan of her. Um, I felt she brought some glamour to the sport of athletics and um, I think at that point in my life, as a, a very young girl, it was quite nice to look up to a figure like that who was fit and glamorous and winning medals um, at major championships. So she was very influential. Um, then as I kind of grew into my teens, I was influenced by the Dave Bedford, Ian Stewart, Brendan Foster era. Um, and they, as real toughs of the track, I think shaped my thinking about running and what I needed to do. And then probably more than any of those was Greta Weitz. Um I saw a lot of myself in her in that she was an endurance runner. Um, she was good at cross country, well, fantastic at cross country and road racing and um, probably struggled with the lack of longer distances on the track, which as a, a young girl, a bit younger than her, I was kind of experiencing the same thing really. 
Um, and I always wanted to be like Greta Weitz. I, I never made it to her heady heights, but she was certainly the the influencing factor um, through my career and the person I, I admired the most. Looking back, do you think that perhaps without being even aware of it, you did have a s- certain philosophy about athletics towards your athletics and your your approach to competitions and, and, and to training as well? I mean, the training is obviously n- what takes up 98% of our time in athletics. Did you have a certain philosophy? Yeah, I think I probably went at everything a little bit too enthusiastically. I um, I remember once I, I, I'd done my training by Wednesday, so I'd done the whole week by Wednesday. Um, I, I sort of perhaps looking back now when it things a little bit too hard, um, I didn't really do many easy runs, and, and although my mileage wasn't super high, um, I, I did throw myself into it. Um, so you know every single run was 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 pretty hard and um so i think my philosophy was perhaps shaped by some of the toughs of the track in the early and mid 70s in that i felt like if i didn't train hard i could never be good and um yeah there is a certain self destruct mode in in part of that but yeah i mean i i relished training hard i enjoyed training with a group of guys who pushed me very hard um and I enjoyed tough competition. So I, I think, you know, I, I was very, very influenced by that kind of um, hard-nosed approach to training that was existed in the mid-70s. And I think I know the answer to this, but what was your best race? What was your biggest high? Well, the obvious one is 84 and my silver medal in the Olympics, not just because it was a silver medal in the Olympics, but I think because of everything that happened before that. Um, I'd been very emotionally um, damaged, I think, by what went on with the Zola Bud episode, not because I had anything against her, but because the press had made me out to be the bad guy and I felt quite strongly about what had happened. Just give listeners the um, the 15-second version of the Zola Bud story. Why, why was that important back in 83, 84? Yeah, well, I, in 83 I was ranked fourth or fifth in the world, I think, time-wise, and I'd finished fifth in the World Championships, been the first British woman to break 840. Um, broken Remember, the you've British got 15 record. seconds for this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I am doing a, not the potted version. And um, the Daily Mail, for whatever reason, felt that it would be great to bring a, a, a brilliant young South African runner over to the UK, um, in a sense, to create a bit of a star for distance running and um, his great great grandmother was british or something yeah and the passport went through remarkably quickly and i still think not everybody knows the full story behind that and um yeah and they were sort of touting her to be the next british golden girl and she had a british vest and all of this stuff was going on while i was in america and a lot of it i didn't really understand or have a clue about because there wasn't any social media or or internet. Um, so I came back into a whole media storm around this golden girl, Zola Bard, and me being the British number one at the time. And, yeah, it, I found it hard to deal with. Um, and it affected my, my training and my running and, yeah, my emotional state. And I ended up escaping to the States about six weeks before the Games, which was my... Saving grace, really. And that's why things coming right in, in Los Angeles in August 1984 was your, your biggest high, I guess. Yeah, because of everything I'd been through before that. And I have to thank um, my ex-husband, Chris Sly, and my coach, Neville Taylor, for just keeping me on track, really. Um, because, you know, 10 days before the Games, I ran a personal, pretty much a personal best for 800 in training. And... Um, I'd gone from somebody that couldn't break nine minutes for 3,000 to um, being able to run close to my personal best um, at 800 and then heading into the Olympics with um, bags full of confidence, which I certainly hadn't had eight weeks before the Games. So if that was your career peak, I suppose, and looking back now, you didn't know it at the time, but getting an Olympic silver medal, which is not bad... What was your lowest point? What was the the toughest experience you had to cope with? Um, 
I was one of the favourites going into one of the first big world junior championships back, oh God, it must have been 78 or 79, I can't even remember, I tried to forget about it. And something just went horribly wrong. Um, and I don't think Neville or I still know or have ever kind of discovered what the problem was, but I just felt absolutely dreadful. And um, I actually dropped out of the race, which I'm ashamed to say. So the whole experience was just a complete disaster. Um, and I was very, very down after it. Um, but I think, you know, any decent athlete does have those big highs and big lows. And I think that probably has to be my lowest point. Um, because I was in such good shape and I should have medalled at that championships and something just wasn't right. There are many great stadia around the world, just changing the subject for a minute, for some fabulous stadiums around the world, some that hold, you know, 20, 40, 50,000 spectators on a big night of athletics, especially back in the 80s. It's tougher to fill a stadium like that now. But what was your favourite place to compete? I think I know what mine was. It was a certain, certain stadium in South London. But what was your favourite stadium? I see. Well, mine would have been Bislett in Oslo. Um, I was very, very lucky. I I was, um, I think I actually made a phone call um, and asked if I could be be one of the athletes taking part. And um, I went to Bislett, God, in the late 70s um, and raced against Greta, which, of course, in itself was just, fabulous for me who'd sort of watched her from a distance or from way back in the pack and um, I broke the British record and I think I ended up breaking two British records on that track um, I think I maybe had one not great performance towards the end of my career but generally I ran well there and the crowd was just amazing and the atmosphere was amazing and I was lucky enough to watch several world records there I warmed up with Dave Moorcroft before he ran his brilliant 5,000 metre world record. I've just got so many fabulous memories of that event. And um, although the stadium's um, been refurbed and it's different now, I still think it's a very special event to watch. And it's great to have seen this week it full uh, capacity crowd again. And the atmosphere there is just, just extraordinary. Um, so, yeah, I really, really enjoyed competing there. Yeah, and, of course, Crystal Palace. Um, I, I had some great, great races there too. Um, but I think Bislett will be the one that sticks in my mind the most. You don't um, end up with a CV like yours in athletics without getting most things right. But if there was one thing you could change, one moment you could change maybe, what would it be, looking back? I think it would be my decision to choose the 3,000 metres for the 88 Olympics. Um, I qualified for the 3 and the 10, and um, at the time, the then governing body of the sport thought I couldn't cope with a 3,000 two rounds and a 10,000 two rounds in the Olympics. Well, of course, I knew I could, and I think many great female athletes since then have proven that it's more than possible but I had to make a choice and um, I chose the 3000 and looking back I think I was better prepared for the 10,000 and um, I, although I did break 840 again in the 3000 I think I was probably in shape to run a very good 10,000 and I think I would have been competitive at the front of the 10,000 as well whether I would have meddled or not, who knows, but um, I think that would have been a better choice. Um, so, yeah, that's probably a regret I have. Like many people in the sport, I guess you've got... You can, you can look back into your life and say, actually, it's shaped your life, the sport of track and field athletics. Uh, so many great experiences, but great people too. Who, who is your best friend in the sport of athletics, would you say? Well, my best friend in the sport of athletics is actually my best friend, my best friend Kelly. Um, we met on that very first day down at the athletics club all the all those years ago, and we've remained friends ever since. We've been through a lot in our lives together. We both had athletics careers, hers at long jump, um, mine um, on the track, 
and uh, we still love watching the sport together. She comes to lots of events with me. Um, and yeah, she's still um, my very best friend, which is great. I suppose you don't make friends necessarily with your competitors. I think you remain friendly and it's been lovely over the years to bump into people. Um, you know, I, I shared rooms with people like Kathy Cook and Sally Gunnell and Chris Boxer, all of whom I got on with very well. Um, obviously, I spent a few years training with with Seb um, and his his father, and so we became very good friends. And you know, I had a lot of friends at Loughborough, Loughborough like your good self, and um, you know, there were just I think it's a very very friendly sport. I, I think there are loads of um, wonderful memories that people who've competed in the sport share and that's what kind of keeps us all together can you um if you can't think of one specific person you could call your best friend can you think of one person who was your your biggest rival or are there just loads of them as well um yeah there were loads of them domestically um people like chris benning chris boxer jane shields um were always going to be tough on the country people like ruth smith um and then Internationally, um, I guess Mary Decker, you know, um, she ran in a way that suited me as a competitor. Um, and I, I loved running against her, um, you know, because she was a, a, a really tough front runner and that, that suited me. I guess that sort of answers my next question, which is who did you most enjoy racing against and who brought the best out in you? And of course, Mary Decker got double gold in the 1983 World Championships at 1,500 and 3,000, the inaugural World Championships, and you finished fifth in both those finals. So is it the same name? If you look at an athlete who brought the best out in you, would you say? Yeah, I think Mary on the track, um, Greta a little bit on the track and definitely on the road. Um, you know, I ran a couple of very, very tough races against Greta on the road in the States, and, you know, I, I beat her... Um, once or maybe twice in that whole period. Um, but when I look back at some of the times we were running and some of the speed that I had to go through five or 10K in to just even keep up with her, um, you know, so she was brilliant on the roads. And, you know, there was, it was a, a transitional period for women's middle distance and long distance running because... We suddenly had a 3,000 and then a 10,000 on the track and the road circuit in the States had become competitive um, and women like myself were were going out to America and, you know, winning prize money and becoming almost professional athletes, um, which was a, a new era for female distance running. So, I mean, you were lucky enough to be a, a, a top athlete, an Olympian, Olympic medalist and, and a professional runner for many years. Uh, and of course, most people don't face that. Most people listening won't be able to identify with that. But they they do know about training regularly and the disciplines they're in. But when you stop your international athletics career and you stop earning money from racing, it's, it can be quite hard to cope with. So, how did you cope with that transition from being uh, an international star and medalist in, in athletics in running? And, and moving on to the next phase of your career. And, and, and was that very hard for you to cope with? I think that whole transition is extremely hard. I mean, I think we were blessed to um, be good enough at a sport we loved to make it our jobs almost. And when it gets to the end of a career and you're barely in your 30s, um, it's it's pretty tough. I mean, your friends are 10 years ahead of you job-wise and... Um, you're a little bit of a lost soul and, you know, I'd run out of savings and desperately needed a job. So um, I just happened to be sat with um, some people from a magazine called Athletics Today, which I'd done a little bit of writing for, and they asked me if I wanted to come along and and sell advertising and that sort of created a transition for me. I mean, I, I went in at the probably the bottom end of publishing low earning the smallest amount of money but um i was able still to talk about the sport be part of the sport um and um learn a new skill i guess 
You have still got a foot in both camps in a way because you've been British team manager uh, in your post-athletics career. Um, and you've been able to, as you say, cope with that transition pretty easily, albeit a few years back from being a, a full-time athlete into a, a career post uh, your competition period, but you must be incredibly grateful for what athletics has given you in your life. You know, lots of friends. Um, it's influenced, you know, your self-esteem. Uh, you've still got a job within the sport. How how do you view the sport now, sort of looking at it from a, a, an overall perspective? I mean, I, I, I don't know what my life would have been like without it. I mean, um, I'm approaching 50 years of being in the sport which is quite scary, um, you know, from a young girl it being my kind of social life to being my professional life, then sort of stepping away a little bit and focusing on becoming a good publisher um, to then doing team management and now coming back and running AW, um, it's always been there, you know, as you say, you know, I've got such amazing friendships, um, I love still being a part of it. I love watching it evolve. I love watching superb performances. Um, I'm still um, in total admiration of stunning performances on the track and the field. Um, I love it as a spectator. I love it um, as a friend of the sport and um, I love being part of it. So yeah, it's kind of um, shaped me, I suppose, really. I presume you love mentoring athletes too. You know, I know you speak to some of the young female athletes in particular that are on out there learning their trade. Um, you've been through that. It counts for an awful lot when you've actually had to cope with those, a lot of those same challenges of uh, perhaps, you know, mixing a, a social life and trying to have a degree of normality to your life as a youngster and yet getting out and training every day, perhaps 10 times a week. Yeah, I think certainly I perhaps myself didn't realise how much experience I had to share. Um, I think you go through you go through a, an athletics career, taking the ups and downs, learning as you go, and not necessarily understanding that it's useful information for other people. And um, and I've learnt that over the last ten or twelve years when I've been involved with team management across country and a bit of mentoring as well you know it it um it's incredibly helpful having had the experiences that I've had and many women from the sport I'm sure could share far more but perhaps they don't understand themselves what what their experience is what value they have what do you reckon the biggest changes you've seen in the sport in yours you say nearly 50 years um I think the evolution of women's distance running um, you know, when I think back to when I started, the longest distance on the track in Olympic Games for women was 800 metres. There was no 1500, there was no steeplechase, um, no 3000, no 10,000, no marathon. Um, so that is now um, a huge chunk of, of the Olympic programme and we've got some amazing female stars that have come through those events, many of them British. Um, and it it still staggers me that that's all happened in my athletics lifetime. And what um, do you see as your current relationship with AW and looking back on it, how it has, has it developed? I mean, as a youngster, many of us just wanted our picture to be in it or our name to appear in it perhaps in a result somewhere but you've seen that go through several phases as well your life with AW yeah I mean when I first bought AW it was a five black and white with a blue masthead and it was predominantly results um and I forced my parents into buying it to see if my name was in it um and just not just to see my name was in it, but I suppose to give my own running some credibility. It sort of made me um, part of the athletics community by buying the magazine. It it made me an athlete almost, um, and appearing on the front cover in 1976 for the first time was um, a very very special moment. I think my mum must have bought every copy in in the news agents um 
and I think I've still got several in my loft because um, I'd finished second in the women's three A's eight hundred um, intermediate eight hundred, so under under eighteen or under seventeen, um, because it was it was a very prestigious thing to have, you know, a picture on the front cover of AW, and what I guess has remained consistent throughout the years that I've AW's been in my life has been the fact that to be on the front cover is really important. You know, young athletes now still see it as a prestigious thing. Shoe brands still want copies of um, the front cover to see their athletes on it. It still carries a great deal of kudos. Um, but the magazine itself has had to change over time. It, it can't, couldn't stay like it was when I first bought it in 1971 or two. Um, and we're reaching a, a new phase of that, that evolution now. How important do you think AW is to the sport? The fact that it has a, 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 it's a weekly magazine, it's, it's produced regularly. And, and there's, I don't think many other countries in the world that have got a weekly athletics magazine or a, even a regularly produced athletics magazine in the way that Athletics Weekly has served the sport in the UK for so many years. I think currently there are probably three well-known athletics magazines in the world. Um, and we are probably, along with Track and Field News and like Latique, you know, known to report on the sport really, really well. I think AW um, does a job that national newspapers don't do anymore. Um, there was a time when um, national newspapers reported on athletics pretty regularly um, now it's really only on the big stars or the big events so we serve to provide a newsroom for the sport really whether that be the magazine or a brilliant twitter feed or facebook or our, our website you know, it's an information source and a, a much needed information source for a sport that's still um, the number one olympic sport i always think that if you're on top of a sport in that way where you've got a website to be maintained and a the, the, the schedule of, make, of producing a weekly magazine, the pressures are enormous. A bit like being a dairy farmer, you never you never get a day off. The cows don't say, okay, don't bother milking us today. <laughs> um, what's what's the, the reaction you get around the world when you say, you know, I'm, I'm publisher of AW, or I work with Athletics Weekly magazine, or AW as it is now. Uh, is it still held in reverence? Yeah, I, I think people have a great deal of respect for the magazine. Um, and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a familiar face in the sport so putting a familiar face with a, a familiar brand um i think we're we're very well received and i think we're seen as um having extremely um powerful authentic editorial um you know we we carry um a huge amount of respect around the world with us and i think my team would totally agree with me when I say that you walk into um, a media centre or um, a press conference and um, people are very keen to snatch the latest copy of AW from you. So so that's the astonishing history of AW we've covered to some degree. What about the future? I mean, just quickly, what's your vision for it? Why are you, why are you so passionate about it? And, 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 you know, what sort of changes have you got in the pipeline? Well, uh, June the 20th sees us become AW. Um, that's very much part of um, making a further transition into the modern world. So, you know, we do have a fantastic Twitter feed, which is, um, you know, that is AW branded and we have a great website. Um, and it's just really um, enabling us to take one brand across all the digital platforms, whether they be Instagram, um, our website, Facebook, Twitter, as well as the magazine itself. So we've got consistent branding across every communication um, platform. And um, I think as well, it allows us to take what we do to a bigger audience. So in today's world where everything really is accessible around the globe um, and information travels extremely quickly, um, and athletics doesn't mean the same thing across the world. Um, AW is an obvious way to go. I mean, people that have known Athletics Weekly for a long time call it AW anyway. 
Um, and I think when you look at the new design, it looks more modern, it looks more punchy. Um, and um, yeah, I think it just gives us a lot more flexibility. When we'll call it a day there, fantastic job for you and your team at AW and, and keeping that that brand alive and vibrant and, and relevant. Um, I still get a, a thrill when my W hits the mat every week. Um, as a youngster, it was the first thing I grabbed and devoured uh, for hours after it uh, it arrived in the house, and that, that's still very much the case. So more strength to your arm and, and, and good luck. Thank you.